and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. It really is that easy. Thank you so much. Previous guests on the show have included Karen Swallow Pryor, Sarah Billups, and Scott McKnight. You could go back, listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Caitlin Chess. Caitlin Chess is an author, speaker, and perpetual theology student. She is the author of The Ballot in the Bible, How Scripture Has Been Used and Abused in American Politics, and Where We Go From Here, and The Liturgy of Politics, Spiritual Formation for the Sake of Our Neighbor. Her writing has appeared at Christianity Today, The New York Times, Christ in Pop Culture, Relevant, and Sojourner. She is currently a doctoral student in political theology at Duke Divinity School. Caitlin and I have a great conversation around how we could use the Bible in America and in our politics, how we could faithfully serve God in our community, how we could work for the flourishing of our local communities, how we could see the whole redemptive story of Scripture and apply that to our lives and politics, and how we can navigate contentious political seasons that are coming up. Join us as we figure out how we could read scripture and our context well so that we could faithfully live out lives that rightly discern who am I in this story. Here's my conversation with Caitlin Chess. Well, Caitlin, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'd love to hear how your story is intertwined a bit with the abuse of the Bible and politics and how you have stayed faithful to Jesus through that. Yeah, so I um, grew up in the church. I grew up in a lot of churches that were really faithful, good places. And a lot of churches, not because we kept leaving churches, but because my dad is in the military. So we moved all the time. And my mom often worked in the church. So I was, you know, not entirely pastor's kid, but sort of in the sense that like, you know, I was in the building all the time. I saw some behind the scenes things, um, but had a really, really wonderful experience growing up. Things that I wish I hadn't been taught. Absolutely. Things I would change. Sure. But I I felt loved and taken care of. And I saw Jesus exemplified in the people that I was around as a child. Um And then when I went to college, I'd gone to public school my whole life. So I thought I should go to a Christian school. I went to Liberty University in Virginia, which if people know anything about Liberty, um, there's a documentary, there's some news about it, like you may have heard. Um, And when I went in 2012, when I started college, um, Liberty was sort of, according to folks there, moving away from some of the moral majority Jerry Falwell legacy that it, it comes from. And then by the time I graduated in 2016, Jerry Falwell Jr., um, the son of Jerry Falwell and the president at the time of Liberty, had really embraced a political role. He was an early and very enthusiastic supporter of Donald Trump. But also there was just a lot of political talk on campus. So there was a lot of um, Ted Cruz announced his candidacy in our version of chapel. Bernie Sanders came and spoke. Um, There was just national media on campus all the time, politicians on campus. Trump was there a few times. And so... It was kind of a both a really disorienting experience when you're at the age where you're trying to figure things out. Like, what do I believe? How do I figure out what I want to thankfully receive from my parents and the tradition I come from? And then what do I want to question or maybe, you know, disregard, actually? That's all happening while I'm kind of at the epicenter of what was happening in 2016. And so it did both really unsettle me. I asked some hard questions about my faith and especially my faith in public, in the political sphere. Um, and I am really thankful to have had some mentors at that time who let me ask hard questions, gave me a diversity of books to read. I didn't have quite the, it wasn't quite as dramatic or chaotic as I think it is for some people who are in context where even asking the question is not allowed. I was really kind of shepherded through that with some really faithful people. And then I went straight from that to seminary. And so kind of thought I was leaving behind. I had gone to college thinking I would go to law school, thought, okay, I'm done. I'm not like doing anything with that. I'm going to go into ministry. 
And obviously, ministry has nothing to do with politics or government. And I started seminary in 2016, so the election was still happening. And really, I mean, all of the years that I was in seminary, which I took quite a few years because I was also working full time at a church, um, I was around colleagues who were going to be pastors. I didn't think at the time that I would do. I didn't come from a tradition where women were ordained, so I wasn't even really thinking about myself doing ministry in that kind of way. But I was around a lot of people who were wondering, like, my church is kind of a mess because of the election, and I don't know what my role is or how I should go about it. Um, And so really, I mean, it feels like the last 10 years has both been kind of an unsettling for me of, okay, I've got to figure out how to faithfully interpret scripture, how to respond to the political moment we're in. And also this, this really good orientation towards, I have lots of questions, but also the Christian tradition has more resources than my tiny little version of the tradition in America. And so how can I explore that? How can I ask questions of that tradition? How can I be a student of it? And that's really what led me towards the end of seminary to say, I'm not done studying this stuff. So I'm actually on campus right now at Duke where I'm working my doctorate and came here thinking, I just, I have to ask some more questions about biblical interpretation, about politics, about political theory. Um, and I feel like I'm just kind of going to be doing that forever. Uh, that's amazing. I think that's so important for us now, today, as we wrestle with these issues of figuring out where does our faith uh, merge with politics and yeah. and how could we faithfully apply the Bible uh, to politics instead of just cherry pick and pick and choose what we want to serve yeah. our own purposes, uh, because there is a lot of good that's uh, that's in Scripture that we could actually apply to what we do in, in our political life in the civic yeah. world. You know, I got my master's in social and civic entrepreneurship. And mm. so I, I was looking at both the, the social aspects of how do we, we build nonprofits to help flourish the city? And then how can we do that in politics? And I kind of ignored the politics because it's, it's way too difficult. Uh, <laughs> that I, I think it is. But there's a lot of things that you, you say in the ballot in the Bible, the book that you wrote, this new book is amazing. It's really good. I highly mm, recommend it to everybody. And so go out and buy it. But let's look a little bit like throughout history in America, how has the Bible been used in good ways? And how has the Bible been used in bad ways? And then what's the, and then I want to get to a place of mm-hmm. okay, how do we do this well going forward? Um, so one of the things that I found was interesting is you go all the way back to the the beginning of our nation. We have pastors talking in the political sphere of saying, let's use the Bible to to move a revolution forward um, and that the Bible has a lot to say about politics and what we are um, doing as a nation, um, a brand new nation. And then we have pastors that say, let's just talk about Jesus and the kingdom, leave that alone and some things didn't work there. What what worked well um, mm. in that time with the Bible and with the forming of a new nation? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people, even though we're, we all are kind of familiar with the idea that there was a lot of Christians at the founding of America, or there might have been Christian ideas at the founding of America, I think sometimes we forget how much biblical language was just all over people's lives, social lives, culturally, um, not just in America, but up across the world. And so if anything, like going back, the thing that has changed is not, do we use the Bible for political ends or not? It's just, we used to use more obscure references <laughs> because people we tended to be more familiar with the Bible than they are now. But the same is true then as is now that that there's just language that is really powerful. And so people want to to use it. And I think if we're if we're thinking about the more positive uses of it, one of the examples I give early in the book is the Massachusetts Bay uh, Colony Governor, John Winthrop, who wrote this very famous, we're not sure if it was a sermon or a speech or where he gave it or if he gave it, but this very famous piece of writing, um, a model of Christian charity that was kind of ignored for a lot of American history, but then especially Reagan, but prior to Reagan, JFK pulled the language from it to describe this vision of America as a Christian nation that had this divine mandate they were following at the founding. And that document, I think, really does show some really positive uses of scripture that we might want to learn from and some really negative ones. The negative ones being 
I mean, it's pretty explicit the way that language concerning Israel and promises to Israel, especially promises of land to Israel, are just easily appropriated for America, which I think most of us today are pretty familiar with. Like we've seen on Facebook someone using a verse from the Old Testament that's definitely about Israel and applying it to America. But what I think is even scarier about this use when you really are honest about it is it really does highlight how that that use of this transcendent, powerful, divine language can justify great violence. In the case of the founding of America, great violence against indigenous people that does make more sense when you think, oh, you were really thinking this was God's gift to you. This land that you were coming to take was not you violently taking this land. It was a gift from God. So you've got to do what you got to do to take the land that God has promised you. So you can see these really negative examples that we then continue throughout our history. But what I think sometimes gets missed, too, is there's also this other thing happening in a model of Christian charity where Winthrop is saying, actually, what's really commanded of us is not just these promises that he's misappropriating, but he's very aware that Israel was also judged for when it wasn't faithful, especially to care for the poor and vulnerable. And so he's very clear that there is this responsibility for those that have wealth or those that have power to take care of those that are are poor and vulnerable. And so we might want to look at that and go, OK, so you've taken a promise that's definitely not a promise for you. That's that's not only a problem just exegetically or hermeneutically, but then it caused real evil. It was really wrong. But also you did understand something important that is described in the Old Testament, not just for Israel, but for other nations, that nations are, dr- are judged by how they treat the vulnerable. And so could we return to that and go, OK, so there was something good there. In fact, even in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, one of the things I really enjoyed in my research was There were pretty, I think, good examples of recognizing that if scripture requires communities to faithfully care for the vulnerable, there's an example in the Massachusetts Bay Colony of someone who was price gouging during a time when there wasn't a lot of, uh, it was a famine, there wasn't access to water or food, you know, putting those prices really high up to take advantage of vulnerable people. And the response was not just, oh, that's illegal or that's wrong for some other reason. It was, you're not being faithful. This is not what a Christian society does. And so we can look back and go, okay, so there's there's really mixed uses here. There's things we want to learn from in a positive way. And then there's other things where it seems so clear to us with his historical perspective. Oh, you really just wanted to justify what you wanted to do. You had financial reasons for it. You had political reasons for it. And then it's really important then for us to go, okay, if that was true in the past, that must be true now. It must be true that we aren't just going to scripture as blank slates looking to have it, you know, really shape our political lives. We, too, often have preconceived political ideas that we are looking to just justify with scripture, things mm-hmm. that will get us wealth or power. And so I I was really hopeful that looking at that history could help us not just come up with some hermeneutical rules. OK, you know, verses about Israel are about Israel, not about us, but also to say, well, can we see some spiritual formation problems at heart here? Can we see how it wasn't just a question of did you exegete this passage correctly? It was. Have you been formed into the kind of person that can hear the word of the Lord against you, that can that can see that scripture is not always for your best financial interests and really respond well? Those are spiritual formation questions that I think are incredibly mm. relevant still to us today. Yeah. If I want to hear a, a sermon about sin, I want to hear a, a sermon about somebody else's sin, right? No, right. my own <laughs> sin. I don't want to hear the judgment against me. It's a difficult thing to to walk into. But as you walk through the history of America and the use of the Bible, a lot of the the good uses of the Bible that I see you use uh, were very prophetic and almost judgments against uh, America and say, we need to treat everyone well in slavery. The slaves are taking the exodus and saying, hey, God is a a redeeming God that he doesn't like slavery, that he's going to lead people out of slavery. We're going to use that to say we need something different because this isn't right. This is this is wrong. How then should we start to use uh, stories of the Bible in a way where we could say we could take a, a real look at who we are as a nation and not just a false optimistic look Mm -hmm. of who we are yeah i mean again i think if there's anything that this research taught me it's that um a really powerfully told story will beat a single command every time (laughs) so the idea that like oh well the bible says that i believe it that settles it 
people like thinking that that's how they work. But really, you know, a single verse that says do this is going to completely be overshadowed by a powerful story of like you are like David or you are like Moses or you are like Jesus, like those kinds of stories where there's a narrative and you can play a part in it are captivating to human hearts. And so what's interesting throughout throughout American history is that that has been both, I think, used towards wrong ends and it also has been used towards really positive ends. The example of the exodus during the kind of Civil War era and then and then as well during the Civil Rights era is a really powerful example. And what I was confronted with doing the research was, well, how can I articulate why I think certain maybe powerful people seeing themselves in these stories as oppressed people is wrong but these people who are really you know truly oppressed seeing themselves in these stories and finding power and strength towards political movements why is that okay and so I, what i really came to believe was that we both have to learn to read scripture really well and we also have to learn to read our context really well i think if there's anything that separates some of the better especially narrative uses of scripture and the worst ones, is the ability for people to rightly discern what position am I in? Who am I in this story? I think it's interesting and it makes perfect sense, but it is interesting that like so many Black Christians in American history have seen themselves as the Israelites captive in Egypt, but there are not examples that I could find of white ministers seeing themselves as Pharaoh in this situation, you know? So Really, I think part of what this teaches us as we look at our history is I I can't just think that if I have a list of hermeneutical rules, I will interpret scripture well for my political context. I'll know how to see what it's really saying. I'll respond appropriately. I'll vote rightly. I'll see the right politician as the right one. I'll, you know, support the right policies. Instead saying, so I have to read scripture. I mean, I really, if there's anything I care about, it's like we should be reading the Bible more, not less. But then I also have to figure out ways to, with the help of my community, with the leading of the Holy Spirit through history and social science and the other kind of good resources God has given us in his creation, I have to discern where am I at? What position do I have? And and really, this is why this is also a spiritual formation question is even those of us who have relative power and wealth, and that includes most you know Western Christians, especially white Christians, it's it's really hard for us to see ourselves in scripture as the powerful people and see and read those condemnations of abuse and injustice as directed towards the really comfortable lives that we live. And so that's going to be a that's not just going to be a hermeneutical process, that's going to be a spiritual formation process. And I do really think especially looking at the black church in American history and reading how scripture has been used by a diverse group of voices within that tradition can be helpful because at first it really will prick you and provoke you to hear yourself described in those kinds of terms. And yet, hopefully with a little bit of distance, that's why I think especially the the kind of Civil War era examples can be really powerful because for a lot of really, you know, relatively comfortable Christians today, you could go back and read those condemnations of white Christians in that era and go, absolutely, they deserve that. So you have a little bit enough distance from yourself that maybe you can hear it. And then maybe you take the second step to go, OK, well, if that was true, then in what ways is it true of me? It's not exactly the same. Um, but in what ways do I need to hear these kinds of these kinds of real condemnations of my position? Um, and how can I hear that in a way that doesn't provoke defensiveness, but really you know, brings me to a place where I can partner with a diverse group of people to see real change in my community, not just big national political issues, but where can I partner with people in my actual neighborhood to see justice in the way that we have modeled throughout our history? Tons of tons of unfaithfulness, but also real faithfulness and partnership and collaboration. And that really, I think what distinguishes those two things is when people who had relative power and wealth were able to see those condemnations as condemnations of themselves that should provoke some change. Yeah. And I think that's hard because it's a, it's a wrestling with, with power, it's reckoning with power of do we have it if i look at the story in the new testament and say hey i want to be like the early church and i want to be like jesus and we're w- identifying ourselves within that story that mm-hmm. story is actually about a, a people group that was persecuted and in a place where there was a powerful nation that was persecuting them the problem with with me saying oh i'm part of that is now that I, I live in the wealthiest country in the world, I with the most power, I'm a part of the powerful system. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it's hard to reconcile those both of those things. I am I'm trying to be faithful, a faithful follower of Jesus in a community yeah. that identifies with those first followers. And I also am living in this political sphere of of just a huge power of America that's just like Rome was back in that day. How do I reconcile yeah. both of those things together? Yeah, that's such a good description of of I think one of the big questions we have to ask and problems we have to ask. I we have to address. I I really understand why people who especially people who are feeling the kind of change, especially in America, it used to feel like, you know, everyone's generally kind of Christian. Christians are in positions of political power and maybe now you're feeling maybe nationally, I think that's harder, but maybe just in your particular context in your community, you're starting to feel like the things that I think are normal are not normal anymore. I just think it makes perfect sense that people would return to the New Testament and say, what does it look like to be the minority in your community? What does it look like to be faithful under conditions of persecution? And but then as you've described, the difficult thing is that's not the reality for us. Like we might feel some level of kind of minority status in some places in America, but that's certainly not true in general. And it's definitely not true when it comes to political power. And so I think part of the challenge for us is to both learn from the faithfulness of Christians under those conditions and say, OK, well, what what seemed concerning to them and what didn't seem concerning to them? And are those the same things for us? But then to also say we, we really have to look at the whole of Scripture here. Um, we are not the New Testament church exactly. And so how do we look at across the canon how Christians with different levels of power responded to it or not just Christians, but the people of God in general? Um, So I actually think in a lot of situations, going back to the Old Testament is really important because we might be in at different times and different contexts in situations that are more parallel to Christians who actually have some level of power over the structuring of their community um, and can can make decisions for the sake of the most vulnerable. And so actually, should we be learning sometimes? Yes. I mean, definitely from early Christians who were in a very different political situation than we are. But also, where do we learn from the people of God throughout the whole history that have actually had great power? And how did they use it? And how were they judged for the way that they used it? Um, Which I do think is what the early church was also doing, right? They have the Old Testament. They're turning to it. They're asking those kinds of questions. And one of the things that's been really helpful for me is um, Oliver O'Donovan, who's a theologian that's written a lot about these kinds of questions at kind of a level that's a little bit inaccessible. So don't pick up one of his books and then be like, this is just really hard because it is really hard. Um, but one of the things that he says that's important for thinking about scripture and ethics more generally, but I think it applies to our political lives, is that we don't just look for prescriptions. We don't just say, OK, well, you know, Deuteronomy chapter three says this. That means this is what we do in our political life. We also ask, what is the the logic behind this? What is the story in which this makes sense? And then say, what does that teach us about how we approach moral problems today? Do we use similar ways of approaching this problem as this clearly described as faithful person did in this story? Do we have the same concerns at mind that they had? Are we asking the same kinds of questions? Are we oriented to our community and to God in a similar way that they are? Instead of just asking, did they do a right or wrong thing? And should I do that right or wrong thing or not? Instead, let's see, like, what what is the story and what is the logic behind it? And I think that can be more fruitful for us when there really is not for many, you know, across the canon, there is not quite as much of a description of the kind of power that we have or the situation that we're in. Yeah. Uh, You wrote this uh, in your book. It says we need to be wary of any approach to scripture that does not place both the text and our own work in the larger context of God's redemptive story. Uh, so how does a narrative, a big picture narrative hermeneutic help us apply scripture and the story of scripture to our everyday political life? Yeah, I mean, I again, one of the things that is just so consistent throughout our history is that we just cherry pick <laughs> everything, <laughs> um, you know, and and at heart, this can be a good approach and, and it can be a form of faithfulness in a certain sense, which is. People are presented with some kind of political or ethical question, and it's a good thing that they're like, OK, let's go to scripture. Let's let's pull up my concordance and see what verses deal with this. And yet that does lead us to really isolate particular verses out of their context and out of the context of the whole story of of scripture. Um, and so having a framework, having thought ahead of time about what is a good kind of framework for understanding all of this? What's a good general story for thinking about our political lives together? 
th- that's really important so that it can at least push against that cherry picking impulse that we'll often have. And just to give like the shortest version of this big story, I think one way that one thing that needs to be kept in mind while we're looking at particular verses that deal with these kinds of questions is that you have at the very beginning of the story a commission given to Adam and Eve to rule and reign, to to create flourishing communities with the good gifts of God's creation. That commission is never taken away, even though it is greatly complicated by sin. And then you have at the end of the story, not a church or a garden, but a city, the New Jerusalem, a picture of human flourishing communities where people bring the, their, their gifts, they apply their skills, they build community together. And so if we have this kind of picture of what it means to be a faithful human oriented towards the good of God's creation and towards the worship of God is to use whatever resources I have to create a flourishing community. And then we have examples throughout the rest of the story of what it looks like when sin confronts that commission. A good example of that being in in the Old Testament, there are mechanisms put in place because there's acknowledgement that in sinful human communities, we will try to create flourishing communities and we will fail. <laughs> like There are mechanisms that need to be put in place to prevent the kind of accumulation of wealth and power generationally in certain people and not others. In in the New Testament, you see this in the early church when there are leaders chosen to make sure that the different widows are taken well care of in the beginning of Acts. So we have pictures of what it looks like to do that with the reality of sin, but we also need to keep this general framework of from Genesis to Revelation, this is our orientation towards the life of the world and the flourishing of human communities. So then when we come to verses like Romans 13, big political <laughs> topic, or we come to regulations in the Old Testament law that we are like, should this apply to our political life or not? We have this framework to test those against. Does our interpretation of this particular verse towards a political end make sense within the context of this larger story or does it not? And it and it might be that then we have to kind of amend some details of that larger story. We want to take seriously every word of scripture, but at least it gives us a check for, am I actually misinterpreting this if it doesn't fit within this larger story? Yeah, that's really important. You know, I I coach and train missionaries, lead a mission agency. And one of the things that we wrestle with is Romans 13. Yeah. And so especially for missionaries going into different uh, yeah. governments than their home government. And what does it look like to be faithful in a place um, but also follow Jesus and help people follow Jesus in that place. Um, and so what you're talking about here is the take it in context of the whole story of scripture yeah. is really important because we take that. I, th- I mean, you've, you have a lot of references of how political leaders have used that to say, you know, yeah. Hey, you just have to be under my authority and you yeah. can't question it because I'm from God. Um, so what are what are some ways Romans 13 has been used poorly and then <laughs> how should we interpret it? Yeah, yeah. For people who it's not coming to mind initially, Romans 13 is the basically obey the government passage. That's how we conceive of it often in America. I think it's funny that our assumption is Romans 13 equals obey the government, not pay your taxes, which is actually what it also says. <laughs> Um, so Romans 13, it's it's interesting. People really fight about what it's even doing there. It's in kind of a strange spot in the book of Romans. Um, it seems very strange that Paul, of all people, who was imprisoned by the government and eventually killed, would be like, the government is from God and God ordains their authority and, that, you know, you should obey them. And um, and so that verse has been used, I mean, pretty much any time that Christians are trying to justify harmful political power, that verse has come up. Um, it came up during um, apartheid in South Africa. It came up during the you know antebellum era with slavery. It's come up even more recently when it comes to immigration policies that separated kids from their parents. It was Romans 13, obey the government. This is the rule. Um, it was used in Nazi Germany to justify the church's acquiescence to the Nazi regime. So it's it has a really fraught history. And I understand why people just on face either think, OK, yeah, it must mean just obey the government or I have to just not ever talk about this because it just it seems straightforward and it seems wrong. Um, and so I think the first thing is to just go, yeah, actually, the fact that Paul wrote this is really important. So it cannot mean and not just Paul, but this was originally received by, as you've said already, persecuted early church Christians could not have been received as just, oh, yes, the government is always good and always makes right decisions and it comes from God. It actually, I think, is like a lot of instances in the New Testament that seem to be kind of acquiescing to political power. There's actually a really subversive thing going on. 
which is that Paul does not just say the government is good. Paul says the government gets its authority from God, which is a direct confrontation to their own story of where they got the, their authority from. The Roman Empire saying it's the Roman gods that really are directing what we're doing. The emperor is a god. For Paul to say, yeah, your authority is legitimate. We're not trying to overthrow the government. But you don't get it from the gods that you think you do. You actually get it from Christ, who you crucified, is a really strong, subversive statement of their authority. I think it also is important to couch it in the context of the rest of Romans, and especially what directly precedes it, which anytime anyone's quoting any verse in the context of a political conversation, it probably is worth it to just look it up and see what's before it and what's after it. I, I had a seminary professor that always used to say he had the like most important hermeneutical rule that you only can learn in seminary, and he would always say, Romans 13 comes after Romans 12. <laughs> like you have to you have to look at what's right. That's really mind blowing. I know, but you have to look at what's right before it. And that whole this this particular instruction about government is couched in the context of a larger discussion about how this early church figuring out its identity. It's no longer tied to ethnicity or to biology, but also it extends across different, you know, loyalties of family and government. And so it's trying to figure out who we are and what do we mean and what is our relationship to people who are not part of us. And so right before that is this description of leave vengeance up to God, you know, treat people with kindness, you know, don't don't think that your relationship to the outside world is one entirely of opposition, in part because you believe this larger story. You believe that ultimately redemption and restoration and justice are coming. So you live faithful lives, but you don't feel like you have to be the one to make everything right. You don't have to respond in kind to the way people treat you. Um, you don't have to fight for justice using means that are wrong because you know that it's eventually coming. It's not up to you entirely. And so in the context of that, it really changes the tone of of the message that's being given. It's like, no, you can exist in any kind of political system because you're no longer a nation. You're a people spread throughout nations. And the government is not entirely illegitimate. You don't have to withdraw from public life and you don't have to overthrow the government, which would have been inconceivable <laughs> to them. You can actually live a faithful life under this authority. And you can actually, and you really should, seek the flourishing of the larger community that you're in. There's There are, are some biblical scholars that actually think part of what Paul's doing in this language when he says, because one of the things he says in this, in this seven verse section is, do good and you will be rewarded. And again, it's like, how could he possibly have meant that? He was doing good. He was not rewarded. Some biblical scholars think he's using technical language here, the language of, of benefaction, the idea that wealthy people in communities would sponsor public service acts. They would build some building that served the community. They would give money to something that served the community. And then part of the kind of normal order of things was that people would respond with praise. And so for wealthy people, that was kind of part of which we see that now with philanthropy, right? Like you have a building named after you because of all this money you gave. So very similar. And so some people think that Paul is saying either to wealthy Christians, hey, you don't just provide for the church. Like you might think you can use my home. I'll build us a a building to use, you know, we can use the the resources we have. We know there were wealthy Christians at this time. Paul is saying, like, no, actually, you still seek the flourishing of your larger community. You still give to those outside of the people of God. And some people even think he might have been kind of playing with this idea of benefaction and saying, actually, it's not just for wealthy people anymore. Actually, all of you are supposed to pour yourself out, not just internally for the church community, but for the whole community that you're a part of. And that starts to feel really like Wow, I, I'm I'm not living under the Roman Empire, so there's some specifics of what they were dealing with that I don't. But that impulse to just just serve internally, just protect ourselves, especially again for a for a persecuted minority church at the time, it makes perfect sense that they would go, let's just make sure we're good. Let's protect ourselves, let's be secure. And the fact that Paul is saying, actually serve the larger community outside of yourself, that's something that that even though we are not a persecuted minority, <laughs> we still struggle with and still yeah, need that we do. word. We need that word. We need it really bad right now is figure out how do we serve the community for its flourishing and to be faithful in the midst of this civic engagement that we we have, because there's all sorts of vulnerable needs that are happening right now. We're moving in to a, a contentious political race uh, next yeah. year, this presidential race. I'm sure it's not going to be fun. Then how do we do this faithfully? So mm -hmm. back in 2020, some churches were taking 
a, a hard political stance of saying we don't turn the other cheek when it comes to politics. We're just <laughs> going to we need power when it comes to, yeah. to politics and we're going to follow Trump no matter what. Uh, some people were were saying, no, we need to care for the vulnerable. I guess we're going to follow Biden this way. So go go this way. Right. Yeah. And then some churches will say we're going to follow follow Jesus in the kingdom and we're going to follow the gospel and we're just going to be talking about the gospel. Um, but that also felt like I don't know how I could actually start to live into yeah. my civic duty, my civic life. So how do we not have the polarity of these two extremes and how do we not withdraw, but yeah. how do we faithfully steward this season that we're coming up in within the church and the church community? Yeah. Oh, I love that you asked that because I do think that that how you've described it does seem to be what most people think the options are. We either kind of are a political church and everyone that goes here is a Republican or a Democrat and you kind of don't offend the sensibilities that you know those people have. Or, and sometimes this is described as kind of the faithful approach, is just like, you know, well, God's in control, so none of it really matters and we'll just follow Jesus. And um, there was some interesting studies done of a lot of churches during the 2016 election that talked about you know, just how prevalent this was. And how often in reality, that church was still an entirely Democrat or entirely Republican church because people can kind of figure out still where their leaders are coming from. And so we just kind of didn't talk about it. And and I understand the impulse towards that third option, especially for people who lived through 2016 and 2020 and thought it's just a mess. It's bad. Any touching of any of it either just, you know, completely infuriates people and I've lost them and I can't convince them or it just is a grasping for power and it's just not faithfulness. I think the best kind of mindset shift that we can have that then has a bunch of trickle down effects is broadening out our sense of what politics is and changing our focus from national elections to local political work. Not that national issues can't be important. They often do affect vulnerable people in our communities. But our ability to shape what's happening at the national level is really small. And it has, I think, a greater pull to really make our national political involvement idolatrous. Um, it's a lot easier for that because we're so distanced from the people who are actually involved in those issues. It's really easy for that to become more about my sense of identity and my loyalty to a particular community than about what I actually started out thinking I wanted to get into. I might really care about certain national issues. But it's it's not really on the ground with people. And so it's really easy for it to turn into, well, it's really just me showing you what kind of person I am, what community I belong to, my identity. And then those clash in our churches. And we're not really dealing with the issues. We're just dealing with like, I think you're a bad kind of person and you think I'm a bad kind of person. Um, I, I really wish that we could say, actually, yeah, but the gospel has particular demands on us when it comes to how we seek flourishing in our communities. And it will deal with political issues. It, we can't be commanded to care for the poor and vulnerable, the immigrant, the orphan, the widow, and not deal with a really broken immigration system, a real, a really broken welfare system, the reality of, of our failing public schools in many places. Like there are practical political demands that are upon us because of our demand, because of the gospel's demand for us to care for those people. But we are really missing, I think, a lot of the work that we can do in our actual communities, whether that is I get to know the people in my neighborhood, I get to know people a neighborhood over that maybe are in a different socioeconomic group than me. I, I have them over to my house. I learn what their needs are. I don't kind of paternalistically pretend that I know and go advocate for them hypothetically. No, I'm in community with them and I know them. And then when they have needs, which they do, I show up to a city council meeting. I write a letter to an elected official. I show up. I mean, in my my particular community, there are a lot of opportunities to show up to just conversations with people across religious and political divides. And that doesn't feel like you're doing a lot. But then you learn about a need someone has. And actually, I have a connection at the governor's office. And actually, I can I can show up to this thing just to be a body that shows that my community cares about this particular issue. Um, it requires more work than kind of social media activism. <laughs> it requires more difficult interpersonal relationships than just saying I watch a lot of C-SPAN. That means I care about political issues. Um, but but that's the kind of thing that I actually think I have seen even in communities 
can bridge some divides. We might vote differently when it comes to the national election. I might, at the end of the day, pick a different person that I think is imperfect than you pick as a person that you think is imperfect. But but could we agree on, for example, this is something in my community recently, could we agree that there needs to be a bilingual translator for housing disputes? Because a lot of the people that are impoverished dealing with housing disputes speak Spanish and not English. So we need someone who can communicate. That we might be on the different ends of the political spectrum, but as Christians, we can agree that that's important and show up together. And then that's not just we've done something politically. I think that's that's really important. We've also built a relationship that has proven to us that there are things that we can agree on, that there are things we can work together on that have a lot more tangible impacts than some of the national stuff we might fight about on social media with. And honestly, it, I think that's more valuable in general. But I also think if we're really having a Christian perspective on these things, in God's economy, we see this throughout scripture, it's that small act of faithfulness that we think pales in comparison to the big national stuff that actually is the really important thing that 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 continues, that God honors, that that brings other effects that maybe we didn't even anticipate. And that's the kind of work that I'm like, if we really believe in the resurrection, if we really believe that God ultimately brings redemption and justice and flourishing, that frees us to go, I'm going to be as faithful as I can with the resources, connections, finances I have. I don't have to think I have to change the world and cut the corners and make the compromises to change the world. I can be faithful with with what's in front of me and 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 plead with God to bring that eventual justice. Mm, that's so good. You know, we all have a contribution to to give. We all see pain points that we are passionate about. We all have value systems that we want to uphold uh, that we can start to engage. And I think a lot of people think uh, because we live in an individualistic society where it's all about the individual, they feel like uh, it's too daunting. It's too big for me to yeah. do anything about. But we're not called to live individualistically. We're not called to live just alone. We're called to live in community. And so there is a community of people that want to help in this situation. One of the things that that you you wrote is this this vision of Jeremiah 29. Um, mm-hmm. And so and I think it is this this faithful work of cultivating uh, ourselves and, and working in the garden, but actually then seek the flourishing of the city that we live. What what about Jeremiah 29 has Mm -hmm. been helpful for you and how is it helpful for us? Yeah, I mean, it's funny a lot. There are some New Testament scholars that actually see this like parallel between Jeremiah 29 and Romans 13, which you would think those are totally different political contexts. I don't know what, but it really does seem once, once you're really in it, I think it makes a lot of sense, which is that in Jeremiah 29, you have this um, exhortation to a people in exile to not only care about the the flourishing of their own internal community, build houses, plant gardens, have families, but seek the peace and prosperity of the city into which God has brought them. And so they have a concern for the inward health and stability of their community, and they're oriented towards literally their captors. Um, and so you have this, this description here that Christian theologians throughout all of Christian history have pulled on and have seen not just instructions to Israel in exile, but instructions to the people of God who are always living under multiple rules. They're living under earthly rules, but then they're also living under ultimately God's perfect just rule and have to navigate people who aren't living under that perfect just rule of God. And so you have this command to seek the flourishing of your larger community. And I think that's really what's happening in Romans 13 as well, under very different political circumstances, and yet similar in the same kind of way. Like, the impulse for both of those groups of people, I think, would be either isolation or you fight back. I mean, that's the whole story of the book of Jeremiah is the people being like, no, we're going to win this. Like, God will protect us. We will be victorious. And Jeremiah being like, no, sorry, you won't. Like, you've got to submit to this exile. I think similarly, the instructions that Paul is giving are you're not overthrowing the government and you're not isolating yourself. Like, don't just hunker down and get through this until God plucks you out of this. I think that would be the impulse for the people in exile as well. Like, okay, Jeremiah was right. We're stuck here, but let's just, let's just bunker down. We'll just await until God, God redeems us. And instead the instructions are build a flourishing community. And Christians throughout history have drawn on Jeremiah 29 for different reasons. And I think especially today, one of the reasons that it's become a really popular verse is not only because it seems like a healthier approach to public life than the visions that we have gotten in the past, 
But the the concern I always have is that people will pull that and say, they'll actually see isolation in it. They'll say, let's focus on the building of the houses and the planting of the gardens and the having of the families and miss that it's not just about, it. you have to have both. If you're not a healthy, flourishing community, you can't serve your larger community, but you also can't isolate yourselves and be a good, healthy, flourishing community. And so I think, as you said earlier, part of the challenge is for us to look at that instruction and then also ask what that instruction says to us who aren't really in exile. <laughs> like in a certain sense, we are. But in a real sense, we have great political power in a country that has always had Christians in great political power. And so if we're not quite in the position of exile and interpreters throughout history have have often said, like, no, we really are in exile and they really were. And so they found comfort and instruction. But what does it mean for us, I think, is a really challenging question to say some of this instruction is still for us. We should, you know, build really flourishing communities and we should be for the life of the city into which God has brought us. But then you have to add the the part of the equation where we we have a history of a lot of power and a lot of abuse of power. And so that yeah. poses some different questions for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before we get in, I have a couple of last questions that I have uh, for you. But I just want to, to let everybody know to go get the ballot in the Bible and read this. And we ha- didn't get to touch on bad eschatology um, and <laughs> things. And I think that's a really important chapter to, to read uh, especially in some some aspects and facets of the evangelical church, of um, how are we misreading, uh, especially Revelations and what's coming, um, and also in your chapter with uh, Bush and Obama was mm-hmm. fantastic. Two distinct versions of Christians trying to faithfully live out their lives of following Jesus, and what does it look like in the political sphere to be able to do that? And I think. Both of those chapters are are really well done, and I think Thank I'm just you. saying people go read that. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. I'd love to sit and talk more. Uh, but a, a couple of questions. One, if you could go back to your 21 year old self, so you're probably looking right in a crazy time. What advice would you give? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, 21. I was yeah end of college ish and facing all of yeah the the 2016 election was coming and um i really think one of the things that i i learned not too long after this but i wish i had thought about earlier was to go back to the larger tradition of the christian faith and learn from christians who faced really difficult political circumstances because in that moment i think and I, and I know that many of my peers this was true of, part of what felt so disorienting was our vision of the Christian faith was pretty narrow. It was like the, the handful of churches that I have been at that were started maybe 30 years ago by the same pastor who might be pastoring it now. And I really only have a pretty short-term American 20th century view of what the church is. And so when that starts to feel unstable, it feels like the whole thing is unstable. Like I have nothing to to lean on because not only does it feel like the people I trusted, I can't trust anymore, but it also feels like, are there resources? Like, has anyone asked these questions before? Is there anything that can help me? Or do I have to just figure it out? I have to reinvent the wheel. I have to figure it out all by myself. And so I wish what I could tell myself then was, gosh, like go way back in history, go around the world. Like there are incredible examples of faithfulness and of of real lack of faithfulness that you can learn from. And and you might discover that some Christian like 2000 years ago wrote this thing that you feel like is exactly describing what's happening now that you find great comfort in. And then suddenly your faith feels more rooted. It feels like not only is it older and further away and around the world than you thought it was, but suddenly the the problems that you're dealing with, while very real, feel actually like aberrations, like they feel like they're not being faithful to the larger tradition rather than this is the whole thing and it's wrong and it's falling apart. Man, that's good advice. Man, I'm Ooh. impressed. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that's so good. I think especially in America, we everything is feels new and, yeah. and urgent and n- now. And we don't learn from the traditions of the past. And I think yeah. I think we're starting to recapture that. I think yeah. we're we've come through a situation saying, hey, we need something that's more stable. And we need some more stability and we need something that's rooted longer in the past. So that's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Um, anything that you've been reading or or watching that you could recommend? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I did very recently, and I've recommended this a few times, read um, Tara Isabella Burton's new book, Self-Made. 
it's all about kind of a, a longer history of the concept of self-creation and how we've gotten to it ends with like the Kardashians. <laughs> but it but it begins with a much larger story about how did we come to think of ourselves primarily as not only as individuals, not connected to a tradition or a family or a culture, but how did we come to this sense that like I make me, I decide who I am in the world. And she doesn't make a lot of judgments about what's good and bad about this. But I actually think that's what makes it more powerful is in seeing all this history, you can kind of begin to ask some questions about things that feel very natural to us and normal to us. Of course, I make myself. Of course, I decide what my identity is. And you start to see how this is not just inevitable, obvious. This is actually a particular philosophical tradition, and it comes from a place, and it's actually pretty recent. And I think it provokes some good questions. And I, I think it's good that she doesn't she doesn't make too many judgments on it. She allows the the reader to kind of ask their own questions about, is this good? There might be some good things about it, but is it also kind of not good? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. That sounds great. Uh, really a, a cultural critique of figuring out yeah. why we're we're self-made. I love it. Yeah, uh, that's good. So, Caitlin, how can people connect with you and go get your your new book? Uh, where would you like to point people to? Yeah, you can get it wherever you regularly get books. Um, I think at, for at least a while now, it'll be discounted at the Baker Book House, which is connected to the publisher, Baker. Um, and you can find me at CaitlinChess.com, where you can find links to the books. And also, um, I wrote these for 2020, but now it's like relevant for 2024 again. But if you go to CaitlinChess.com, you can find some prayers and spiritual practices for an election season. So that could be some good wow. preparatory uh, work in advance. <laughs> yes, we need that. We definitely need that. Uh, that's good. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for this conversation. It was fantastic walking through the history of how we use the Bible in America and our politics and how can we faithfully serve God and our community and how can we work for the flourishing of our communities here and now locally where we're at uh, and, and how can we faithfully look at the Bible and the whole redemptive story of Scripture and apply that to our lives and to politics. So thank you for this conversation. It was like great. And uh, you have a great one. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week. <laughs>